ago when I joined the Mayland Historical Society, one of the things I kept hearing about was the pottery. The pottery that was down on the peninsula around the turn of the 1900s. <laughs> Nobody seemed to know where it exactly was. I got the impression that it was something to do with the brickworks that we now know. I was wrong. I have been lucky enough to find a book by the granddaughter of the person who built the pottery. And she, in amongst a whole lot of family history, which is fascinating, also has a lot of the history of the pottery. So, the Mills Pottery had its beginnings, and that is the Mills Pottery, in a, I think around about 1920. <coughs> We've now got Waterworld, um, the tennis courts, etc, etc. <coughs> in that same area. There's that little island in the middle of the, the river. Um, the Mills Pottery had its beginnings in 1845 <coughs> at Campbelltown in New South Wales when John Mills was born to John and Margaret Mills. John Mills was a labourer and his wife the daughter of a log splitter. The baby was christened John Mills. In his late teens John had moved to Victoria where in 1865, aged 20, he found some pipe clay at Campbellfield, 10 miles north of Melbourne. Setting up a pottery works in Campbellfield, he exploited his find. By 1868, it seems John Mills was confident of success as he married Rose Augusta Herman in Melbourne. Rose had been born in Bristol, England in 1870 and 71. She had two daughters and in 1873 she brought John Frederick Mills into the world. Sadly, Rose died in 1875 of pneumonia. This story started as with an interest in the pottery. It developed very much into a story of its people, the people who built it, the people who ran it. John Mills remarried in 1876 and his second wife, Catherine McCulloch, bore him another eight children, mostly daughters. Moving closer to Melbourne, his pottery in Victoria Street West, Brunswick, was registered as federal pottery and he was quite successful in the trade. So successful that when he heard that the Kalgoorlie Gold Rush had led to excess wealth in the Western State, he decided to expand his business by leaving his pottery in Brunswick in the hands of a manager. Aged 55, he moved west with his second son, uh, sorry, with his eldest son. That is John Mills. <laughs> he had obviously heard of the clay deposits here on the Maylands Peninsula. As he arrived with his son, John Frederick Mills, and they walked to the site he had purchased and camped overnight in an abandoned convict-built house on the site. So somewhere there, there was a convict-built house. Their night was interrupted by the appearance of an angry old man <laughs> with a shotgun who came to evict the trespassers in his building. There may even have been a shot fire. After explanations and introductions, Mr. Hardy and Mr. Mills became good friends. This was the Mr. Hardy who was chairman of the Perth Roads Board. And he, of course, had inherited the, the land down there. And somewhere there, there was a convict house, two-storey built, uh, stone house built. That became the, the Mills home. The remains of one of the barges built for, um, for Mills Pottery 
one of the remains was remembered by John Frederick's daughter, Mary Russell, as lying on the river at the bottom of Hill 60. Now, Hill 60 is the opposite side of the river, and it's where the Sandringham Hotel used to be, or possibly still is, I'm not sure. But she remembers that as one of the barges. Um, the company had built two barges, and a rowboat. The rowboat was named Daisy. I don't think that looks like a rowboat. I think that's one of the barges. And I think we may well have been given wrong information by the Daily News, who called that the Daisy. Anyway, John Mills and his son re rented a small house in Wellington Street and hired a 30-year-old Ballarat-born woman Miss Ida Lever to take charge of the office. The shop was built in Pier Street opposite the Salvation Army Fortress and Minnie Mills, the widow of Robert James Mills, a nephew of John Mills, who had been wounded in the Boer War and died in 1905, managed the shop. Later, Minnie and John Frederick Mills managed the Maylands and Belmont potteries and were responsible for the growth of both. Ida Lever purchased Lot 227 on Garden Island and a year later signed it over to John Mills, who then built a house in 1906. Oops, there we go. John Mills had a launch named Australia to travel to Garden Island. The First World War caused Garden Island to be resumed by the Commonwealth for defence purposes and the Australia was purchased by the Navy for £1,300 for naval duties and it was sunk in the far north. Not a good war for John Mills. Back to the pottery. In 1898 the business began importing... This, there's John Frederick Mills. Right, now we're right. Yeah, we'll stick with John Frederick Mills. That's the son, the eldest son. And he's the guy who basically ran it. Don't forget, his father was 55 when he arrived here. The son was growing up and taking over the business. In 1898, they started importing stoneware pipes from Melbourne and the creation of the Mills Pottery was a godsend for the Perth City Council who were setting out to provide sewerage and drainage works for the city beginning in Kings Park, the high point, and running down to Claysbrook. New sewer pipes, need, uh, sorry, new city sewer lines needed fire clay, fired clay pipes and the Mills Pottery was able to make literally miles and miles of them. This was the basis for their business success. The back of the ground floor had a big bench where Mr Dick Pennington, under the direction of the mills, turned out finials, gargoyles, I've got this, hang on, I've got to come back, no, I don't, I, there we go. <coughs> the back of the ground floor had a big bench where Mr Dick Pennington, under the direction of the mills, turned out finials, gargoyles, moulds, etc. for house trimmings and also threw flower pots on his potter's wheel to add to the very flourishing trade of pipes and later tiles. So there is work from the mills pottery that we can spot in Mayland still. And we've seen the gargoyles, the finials. There's one on top of this building, a gargoyle. There are flower pots, uh, sorry, chimney pots, chimney pots on the top. There are little square decorative bits with holes in the middle along the top of the roof. And they were also the sort of things that Mills Pottery were making. The majority of them that you can see around Maylands from buildings built around between 1900 and 1920, 1930 were probably made <clears throat> by Mills Pottery. 
Mill's children also created their own marbles in the kiln. I think most of us played dugs at school. Well, they, I know I kept losing them. I, couldn't, I wasn't a very good player of marbles. But the Mill's children could make their own. She also wrote, on sunny holidays, when other children came to play, we were given leave to ride on the rail trolley. I'm going to go back here. Now we need to come all the way back. One of those lines, probably the one through the middle, right, right down, was originally a railway line, gravity run, to take the pipes down to the river where they were loaded onto the barges. We were given leave to ride on the rail, rail trolley which ran from the big clay mound at the top of the pottery down through the banked up reedy ground to the river's edge. A length of, she says, half to three quarters of a mile downhill. I think that is a little child's memory of several hundred yards. The rail car being self-propelled and gaining quite a speed, stopping at the bunker with a thud and then having to be pushed laboriously uphill. It was a breathtaking feeling rattling down the steep slope doing the, along the built-up lines over the river, no, over the river mud, knowing the river at the end went straight down 20 feet or so and perhaps we mightn't stop. <laughs> a little girl's memories. It is telling in this modern day and age that a lady of some 80 years plus, which Mary Russell was when she wrote this series of stories, just 25 years ago, about 1995, she did not include photos of the ladies of the family, just her grandfather and father. So, the pottery itself, there we go, and we've got the barge sitting there waiting to be loaded. And a section of the second image, doesn't show, that's strange, oh well. They had Mills Brothers emblazoned across the top of the, or oh, sorry, Mills pottery emblazoned across the, the top of the building. So the following tenders were accepted in 1908 or 1906. Can't quite see. 1906. Stoneware drain pipes, Mills and Co and Perry and Pitmus at schedule rates. So we've got the Perth City Council starting to buy pipes at that stage. 1906, the principal event was the second election for the Federal Parliament. In 1906, after that election, the Sunday Times commented that it was a pity that all the senators from Western Australia were then from the Labor Party. This was despite a fairly vigorous campaign on the part of Mills and Co. The Times referred to a lavish expenditure of boodle, which did not make up the leeway. This was probably all organised from Garden Island where John Mills had built his house, docked his launch and spent his day fishing. He was a big, fish, big time fisherman, sports fish, uh, fishing, and he was also very fascinated with a great follower of cricket, as we found out, as I found out later on. following year, they were in court. Well, one of their staff was in court. The excuse given for stealing 40 pounds was drink and women, but he was only 19 years of age. <laughs> yes. So, yes, he should have been ordered birch and a term in the industrial school. Then in 1908, 
We've got a report on what the government was doing with the city drainage and sewerage system. And they're quite, the drain is five foot six inch in diameter, great big, great big one. Um, and they were running down to about six inches in diameter late in, uh, sort of, as they got closer to the homes. And they were doing everything, it's interesting, they were fully surveyed, everything was done in feet. There was so many feet to this section and so many feet to that section. In this particular project ran about three kilometres. It's also interesting that it mentions not on the section I've got here but further down that the sewerage was going down to holding ponds at Claysbrook. That was the original sewerage ponds, the mouth of the Claysbrook River, uh, stream, brook, whatever. Um, so they needed more, uh, more ability to make pipes. So in 1908, the Belmont Pottery began under the day-to-day -day direction of Edward Mills, the younger half-brother of John Frederick Mills. One contract alone that the company took up called for 300,000 pipes. It was not a small business. And we've got more photographs of the Belmont Pottery than we have of the Maylands Pottery. That's an interior shot of Belmont, and that's their yard outside Belmont. You can see some of those 300,000 pipes. There's also quite a little harbour for the Belmont pottery, and that's... I think there used to be a street called Wharf Street um, in Belmont and that is at the end of it. It's now being built over by multi-storey residential houses. They also later on built a major yard by about 1920 in Fremantle where even more pipes were made. In 1908 the Joel Street office opened just down here and you can see the sorts of material they were making. Then, by 1909, Mills Pottery was a major employer in Perth. There were 60, 60 workers in not just the Belmont, uh, not just the Maylands pottery, but the Belmont pottery as well. There was still a strong connection with the Melbourne-based family. Early in 1915, the then 70-year-old John Mills took a trip back to Melbourne, as several of his sons-in-law had joined up to go to war. One was killed at Gallipoli, and another wounded. Although he did make it back to Australia before dying shortly afterwards. So not only cost him his boat and his house, it cost him his two, son, two sons in law. In 1915, the managers of Mills Pottery, John Frederick Mills and Minnie Mills, the widow of his cousin, agreed to a union demand for increased wages. This was despite the pleas of other pottery owners. The Mills Potteries employed more than half the workers in the industry. Despite the opposition to the Labor Party back in 1906, the management now seemed sympathetic to the unions. In 1919, there was a major electrical storm in Perth. Many buildings were damaged and the pottery was badly damaged. A new small tile roof building was demolished and, the, and about 16 metres by 30 metres of the pottery roof was torn off and a 10 metre square portion of the roof was blown about 100 metres away. That's not the only buildings, 
that were damaged, but there were many others right through Perth. It seemed to have been a major, major storm. Around 1920, according to Mary Russell, the chimney was demolished as the pottery was electrified. The line was run down from Maylands and controlled electricity, rather than lightning, arrived on the peninsula. The 1920 post office recorded, and you can see it there. We've got a pottery in Essex Street, Fremantle, there's sanitation engineers and plumbers. Pottery and hardware merchants, 41 Pierce Street, Perth. Potteries at Belmont and the Peninsula Maylands. Yet one more Mills pottery was built at Claysbrook on the upstream junction of the Swan River at Brown Street. This was built after a bit of a family problem and the second son, born to the second marriage, Edward William, left the Belmont Works where he'd been managing and began managing the Stoneware Pottery Limited in 1916. That was already at Claysbrook. And then in 1921, he seems to have started his own pottery next door to that while remaining manager of Stoneware, separate from the rest of the family businesses. While in Maylands, Belmont... Uh, sorry, while the Maylands, Belmont and Fremantle potteries were working mostly in terracotta, the younger mills of Claysbrook branched into finer China, as was reported in the Daily News of the 12th of October. And it's a very glowing report of the material that they were pr uh, producing. By 1920, John Mills was 75, although he still owned the businesses in both Western Australia and Victoria. He had left the day-to-day -day running of the businesses to others for around 15 years. So from 1922 to 1926 he turned his mind to travel and took several overseas voyages. More on that later. In 1928 and early 1929 he decided he'd had enough of business and he sold his West Australian potteries to Wonderlick and Co, who later became Brisbane and Wonderlick. And Lance Brisbane was their West Australian operative. Wonderlick were an Australia-wide company. He then went back to Victoria and sold the Federal Pottery in Brunswick. Wonderlick closed the Belmont and Claysbrook potteries almost immediately. That was the time of the Great Depression. It had just struck. John Mills got out of pottery just at the right time. They kept the Peninsula pottery going until the mid-1930s, despite the Depression. On Sunday, March the 8th, 1931, John Mills died, aged 86. Reported as six foot six inches tall and a commanding, erect figure, he is buried with a Wesleyan service, which would have cheered his friend Mr Hardy in Mayland. Okay, uh, somehow I left a couple of pages off at the finish, so I will just run through because it's all up here. Put that back on display. After he died, the family was unhappy with his will. He left a fortune of £85,000 in 1931. Sue did the very good thing for us and worked out just what that was really was in our money. It was eight and a half million pounds, uh, eight and a half million dollars. So it's quite a substantial fortune, especially since the depression is, has wiped everybody out. He left his office manager, Ida Lever, and his daughter-in-law or niece-in-law, I've been unable to, to ascertain that exactly, Minnie Mills, as the executrix of the will. The, he'd given a block to both his sons. One of his sons had died early, in about 1928, 27. 
So he only had two sons left. They each had a block of land in, in Victoria. The girls in the family were most unhappy. And why suddenly became clear. They had hired a King's Council to run their case to say, say that the will was invalid. That person was a R.G. Menzies QC. <laughs> um, the reason they were upset became obvious with some of the evidence that came out. Remember I mentioned that he'd taken up overseas travel. In 1922 he took Ida Lever, who had originated in Ballarat, to Colombo. In 1925 he took her to England and in 1926 he took her to Fiji. He had left his wife in 1900, his second wife. He left her back in Melbourne with the, with the girls, some of whom were still at school. He apparently supported her but he'd left, come over here with Ida and Ida did a lot of his work for him over the years. No wonder the eldest son of the second decided to leave the firm and start up his own business because he was busy taking orders from the woman who'd taken his mother's place in the family. After lunch, they the, the luncheon break in the court case, they, apparently they all sat down, had a talk and decided to withdraw the case. They all got, everybody got at least $800,000 in our money um, out of the will and that was spread through the family. It, nobody missed out. The wife, second wife, Catherine, received eight pounds a week for the rest of her life. She apparently had money of her own anyway. So he'd been supporting her through that 30 years um, with some form of maintenance. Um, he'd been back in 1915 to visit the sons-in-law who were going off to war. So there was still a family connection there. Catherine McCulloch, his second wife, died in 1954 and Ida Mills died aged 90 in, I think it was 1954 as well, but a lot after John Mills had died. That was the story of the family, the story of the pottery and how it affected us. We can still see the, um, some of the works. One of the things that I wasn't able to do was to um, find a pottery mark. We all know about goldsmith's marks and silversmith's marks. Potters also had marks. And there are lists, great learned lists of potter's marks available. I'd never been able to find a Mills pottery mark on any of the um, on any of the websites. They just don't have them. I've got a cousin who runs a closed genealogical and history, historical Facebook site, and she's taken up the habit of posting our meetings on the site to show what's going on. And she posted on Saturday the um, the announcement of, or our minutes, and the announcement of of tonight's meeting. This morning I had a look at it, and there, from one of her, one of the other members of her group, was this. We have finally found a. Potter's mark for Mills and Carr. And if you notice, 
it's at Pier Street and Murray Streets. That's right. And that is now where Miss Maud's is. So that is the Mills Pottery, that is the family that built it and how it still affects us because we can still see some of their work if we know where to look. Look up at the top of the buildings and you'll see some Mills Pottery work. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk, and um, I've been with John in his um, exploration, finding out, and every time he's found something out, he's come at me, told me he's so excited <laughs> about adding to it, and to actually have it now all in this one document, basically, is wonderful. We even sat down at one time and listened to Frank Greenslade's talk on Mills Pottery, which happened a long time ago, so um, that was a bit thin on information, yeah. but we've been, it was a, certainly a good basis. And um, that's really, really wonderful. So, John, um, oh, I'd just like to do any questions. Any questions? Well, um, I'd just like to make a couple of observations, more particularly about the earthenware pipes. Yes. Uh, my father um, was a labourer uh, and worked for the uh, on the water supply. Right. And, and lowering grain through pipes. Yes. Uh, once he got into his sixties, he was uh, the gardener's pastor. Yes. <laughs> so he, he got his job, which was common in those days, out at Stoneware uh, testing pipes. Oh now, right. No pipe was allowed to be used unless it was properly tested, as you can imagine. Yes. Putting it around <laughs> in such an important job. And uh, I think all they did was build it with a hammer or something. But providing it rang. Yes, it rang. Pipe. And they had a mark on it for the water supply. Right. And yes. Otherwise, it didn't work. Uh, but I think the thing that you need to understand you, you mentioned there the length of the pipe and the diameter. Yes. Uh, it's very hard for us in our day to try to visualise exactly how they did the job. Now, I was in, I lived in Morrison Street, Main Ads, right. which our, our house fronted up or back on to a big swamp. A, a seasonal swamp yes. uh, came up in, in winter, but there was plenty of water there. They did put a, a pump station there eventually, it's right. still there. But they went through the back lane putting in the sewage. Before that, we had a dunny down the back. <laughs> uh, but it was remarkable. They had a gang of blokes, and to me, I, as a child, I remember looking and thinking it was all absolutely normal. They wore Grey flannel shirts as they did cut off here, yes. old baggy pants tied at the thing here to stop the dirt getting up, uh, old boots and a hat. And a hat. On the head. <laughs> Everything was done by hand. Yes. In order to get the pipes down, they had to put in inside it. Nowadays, they get a, a machine and a bank down. These were put down in the form of uh, jarrah planks. Yep. About this wide, that thick, and quite wrong. And they built up a bit of a stand, and two men would stand would stand up there with this great lump of steel on a large, yeah, yep. on a large, uh, a large hammer. Both of them lifting this and belting this down by hand. Uh, and you can see it going down bit by bit. Absolutely terrible labour. And then they have to butt up the next one and go through the whole job. A yep. whole trench was done like that. And now, the slope had to be right. Absolutely perfect all the way. They did it by sight line. Yep. And the other thing was that it was swampy. Now, to get the water out, they had a sludge pump. Now, a sludge right. pump in nowadays is a <coughs> thing. You see them if you go past anywhere yep. and there's water coming out. This, this took two blokes on a large another large lump of steel with this great wide open open pump uh, and the pipe going out all day just, just pumping this water yeah. out mm -hmm. so it's you know the pipes are wonderful but the average person had no idea of what the labour was to get that sewage in yeah. I think it's it's, a, it's something the sewage the drainage it was all for granted yeah. it should never be no. so that those people who put Pipes down are as should be as remembered as long as oh, yes. these people will. That's right. 
as well as the people who made the pipes themselves. Yeah. Really good observation. Yes. That really brings it to life. Actually, yeah. the yeah. other, the, the more <coughs> gruesome side of it, if you like, with regard to so yeah, John, John, John was talking <laughs> about the owners, talking about the owners. But what about all the people who did all that work? So, yeah. Yeah. lovely description. Alfred. I only found the name of one, and that yeah. was Dick Pennington. Yeah. And yet there were a lot of other workers as well. Mm. Well, I want to get on and congratulate yeah. you on that tour. Thank you. And I'd like to present you with a red and white and a Thank you.